Hey, hello everyone. What's up? What's up? Thank you so much. I have a new stand up desk, so it's kind of making me look short. I got to figure it out. Um, what's up? Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jeanette. Who's that? How are you? It's Lankea. Hi. Hi, what's up? Oh my gosh. It's so nice to talk to you. Yes. Thank you so much for doing the challenge and for oh, being so for creative. You are so creative. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having that challenge. It really was a challenge. <laughs> that first week was brutal. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so being raw in the winter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, I'm in Florida, so it's not, I can't, I can't even complain about that being a problem. Yeah, but but it's been cold here. Well, what part of Florida? I'm in central, uh, Clearwater. Yes or no? Has it been colder than ever before? Or just me? It, it has, but then, I mean, it typically just wears off throughout the day, and then it gets back colder nights. So mornings and nights are usually the coldest, but it's still you know, it gets warm. So I can't complain like the rest of the country. You know, they're below zeros and snowing. I've been here three years and this is the coldest it's ever been. Um, So oh, this wow. is actually a good topic. So everyone that is coming to Woodstock Fruit Festival this year, I just want everyone to know that the average temperatures and Chef Ocean just joined, so we're going to get into it. But the average temperatures have been um, at night. The lows have been around 60 Okay, and the highs have been around 80. And so that's a very dramatic difference. That's 20 degrees difference. And I just want everyone to know right now it's 68, but it's been as low as 60 degrees, which, you know, for us, like, you know, spoiled South Floridians, that's intense, 60 degrees. So I just want everyone to know that's camping. Definitely bring, you definitely need a sleeping bag and you need a warm blanket. And I would bring at least one sweater um, because, you know, it gets a little chilly at night. We are going to have a campfire, though. And Chef Ocean is here. Thank you so much. Oh, he's gone. Wait, <laughs> he was here and then he's leaving. Hi, Chef Ocean. How are you? <laughs> Doing well. How are you? I'm so happy to see you. And I'm really, really excited to work with you again. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, Chef Ocean is the head chef of Woodstock Fruit Festival. And he's been doing that for the past, I think, two festivals, right? This will be no, your third. My third year, yeah. Yes, yes. And this is very exciting because, you know, to have a chef, a professional chef making us really delicious, raw, vegan, low fat, gourmet cuisine every night is just like the dream come true. So let's just begin with, um, while everybody's joining, why don't we start with what got you interested in the raw vegan lifestyle and uh, how long have you been doing it? Uh, let's see. So it's uh, been over 20 years now. So I've been 100% raw vegan, um, became vegan first and then transitioned to raw, uh, mostly to cure uh, some acne conditions that I had. So I found that if I stay on a raw foods diet that uh, my skin um, doesn't get any breakouts. And so I've been, um, you know, doing that for uh, for long enough that I don't have to worry about what I eat anymore. So I, as long as it's raw and living foods, then I don't have any skin conditions. That's what really got me into it was, was trying to heal my skin. Yeah, amazing. And you have perfect glowing skin. I have seen you in person. So yeah, yeah, everyone is glowing at Woodstock. And um I just want to say we are live also on YouTube. So the YouTube viewers, if you guys have any questions about Woodstock or any questions uh, for Chef Ocean about what he's going to be doing at Woodstock, um, leave it in the chat. I will ask him, okay, for the people that are live on YouTube. And uh, people here, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat or you can raise your hand as well. But um, I just wanted to say that before we get started. So Ocean, can you just tell us, first of all, what is it like to attend Woodstock Fruit Festival? What what has been your experience? Uh, I guess in two words, it's like summer camp. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go to summer camp and we would spend time out in the woods, like looking at bugs and making little uh, sketches of trees and, you know, playing in the water and 
um, you know, just generally being kids. And so you don't really get an opportunity to do that as an adult that much because, you know, we don't get summers off unless you're you're in a profession like a teacher where you do get summers off. And then, you know, you're caught up in all these daily things like paying bills and, you know, mowing your lawn and uh, all the normal things that adults have to do. So I found Woodstock is kind of a break from that. And um, it's a way for um, people who, you know, might be exploring better ways to treat themselves. So a lot of times when we go camping, um, you know, alcohol is a big part of camping or cooking hot dogs over the fire. So this is also um, a way for people who want to, um, you know, do things that are more productive, I guess, for their own health. It's a summer camp where you can feel safe and say, hey, I'd like to eat fruit for a week, or I don't want to smoke, or I don't want to do any alcohol, and you don't feel any pressure, you're in a very nice, safe space to do that. And I also think that um, because, uh, you know, I, I don't have a restaurant now, I do recipe books, but I used to run pop-up restaurants at festivals, um, that this is my one opportunity each year for one week to just serve people. And that's what I really like to do with my food is, you know, recipe books and doing lessons on Zoom are, are really fun, but it's it's more, you know, the one-on-one -on -one and being able to just share that, um, you know, the, the creativity and art, artistry of raw foods with people for a whole week in this nice safe space and, and really bring out the child in people. Yes, I love it. And I totally agree. You know, we write recipe books, but like the joy is in the serving and, um, oh, I'm, I'm really excited. It's the best week of the year for all of us, not just the attendees, but all the volunteers and all the people that run the festival too. It's truly the best week of the year. And um, there will be no hot dogs, that's for sure. Um, so now, Ocean, tell us, uh, let's just jump right into it. What are some of the things that you will be crafting with your team this year for the festival? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, let me bring up the menu. So uh, last year, we introduced the gourmet raw foods um, for the first time. Uh, we were doing um, Chris Kendall, who was running uh, the kitchen or the gourmet sauce team um, previous, um, previously to my coming on board, was um, basically making sauces and dressings for the salad bar. So um, last year, we experimented with um, what would happen if we did some raw vegan gourmet foods, you know, just to kind of supplement the menu. And it was a big hit. So um, we got some feedback from people about what they liked and what they didn't like. And now we took off things from the menu that were not necessarily, um, that, that weren't the crowd favorites. So basically we took all the crowd favorites and we kept them on the menu. And then I added a couple new items to the menu. So uh, each night is a theme. And so the first theme is Italian night. So we're introducing Italian cuisine with a chunky marinara sauce and a pepper cheesy dressing. And those are like sauces that you can use on your salad bar and your zoodles. Um, you can drink them like a soup if you want to. And then the gourmet meal for that night is lasagna. So my team is going to hand make lasagnas. And um, I think we're gonna do two or three layers of the lasagna. And that was actually the, the biggest crowd favorite from last year. So we just start off the very first day with what everybody really wants to, to try is the best thing that we make. So I would say get in line early for the lasagna. We'll have plenty for everyone, um, but it's uh, also a little challenging because we try to make the best versions of these foods possible. So that means no salt, no oil, and no nuts. And there's different reasons for not incorporating these, but the main one is we want to accommodate as many people as possible, right? And so some people have nut allergies and some people like myself, we, we don't use added salt. So it's going to be not only really good gourmet food and really good lasagna, but the best possible nutri nutritional value uh, for you without you feeling hungover or feeling like I ate too much or got bloated or anything like that. So it's going to be extremely healthy versions of these foods. Um, so the second day we move to a Thai cuisine and we have um, a Thai mango sauce and a tropical heat sauce because people love spicy stuff. Um, if you don't want spicy things, that's OK. We always make one non spicy um, uh, sauce each night. But the tropical heat is we're going to make that nice and spicy because people really enjoy that. So um, and then the coconut curry, that's one of my favorite. Uh, and I think that was actually shown in the newsletter. We have coconut curry that we um, we're using, I think, broccoli and cauliflower. And then we're going to use some really nice Indian spices to make it um, just absolutely as flavorful as possible. 
And then um, we go to day three, which is the American menu. So in the American menu, we have a summer corn Dijon dressing and a barbecue sauce, of course, because it's American. And the barbecue sauce is going to be nice and smoky and have a lot of really, really good flavors to it. But then we also introduce coconut ceviche. So that's, um, you know, the American menu encompasses both North and South America. And so the coconut ceviche is going to have mango and a little bit of hot pepper and some basil and some coconut in it and some lime juice. And that was also a crowd favorite from last year. So that's going to be a fun one. Um, so we still have four more days. So we're only halfway through so far. And then we go to Mexico for day four. And Mexico is going to be tacos. So I think, let's see, day one is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, it's going to be taco Saturday. <laughs> I wanted it to be taco Thursday or taco Tuesday, but it's going to be taco Saturday. And we serve that with a pie of lime dressing and then guacamole. So it's going to be fantastic guacamole. We got a lot of good feedback last year about our guacamole. And in fact, everyone on the team practices the guacamole on the sauce and dressing team. We all make little batches of it. And then we try to figure out what the best version of it is. And then we serve that version for Taco Saturday for our Mexican theme. And then um, one of my favorite dishes or cuisines is Mediterranean cuisine. So I have a really good hummus recipe. Um, it's not going to include any nuts as, as hummus often does when it's made vegan. A lot of people use uh, almonds, but we're going to do this entirely fruit based and then serve that with a tzatziki sauce. And then again, we're going to have a really nice hot sauce to go with it. So the hummus um, is uh, I, that was also very highly rated last year. And, and it's just going to be fantastic. We're making everything from scratch. We're not even using canned tahini or anything because it's really difficult to get raw tahini. So we're going to start from the sesame seeds, sprout the sesame seeds, blend them up in a Vitamix and make our own tahini. So everything's from scratch the entire week. So we don't use any packaged or, or canned ingredients. Um, so then my specialty is Indian cuisine. I ate a lot of Indian food when I was in college, um, mostly because the Indian buffet was $7 and it was all you can eat. And that was the only meal I could afford because I was a, I was a poor college kid. But I got a lot of practice with eating Indian food, and now I'm actually developing an Indian recipe book, and I took the best recipe from my Indian recipe book, which is Malai Kofta. So if you're not familiar with koftas, they're little, uh, I guess, like nut ball, nut vegetable balls that are often put into like a really spicy um, tomato sauce, and there's different versions of it. We're going to be doing Malai Kofta, which is the tomato cream sauce, and using coconut for the cream and then serving that with a tomato chutney and um, a curry sauce dressing. So that's my favorite night. I think that's going to be, let's see, Wednesday. I think that's going to be Tuesday, maybe Monday night. Yeah, so Monday is going to be Indian night. And then the last night, uh, correct me if I got the days wrong, Jeanette. We, we're shifted a little bit. We usually go for Sundays and Saturday. But I, I know. It's Wednesday tough. through Tuesday this time, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now we're, we're in the final night. And the final night is going to incorporate everything that I've learned about California cuisine from my many years living in California, being a chef in California, and the special type of cuisine called California cuisine, it's California fusion cuisine. So it often takes elements of different cuisines, like Japanese cuisine or Mexican cuisine, and then just fuses it all together in kind of a French way with lots of fresh ingredients. So that night we're gonna be making nori wraps and the nori wraps are gonna have sunflower tuna made with sprouted sunflower seeds that we sprout the night before, especially just for this dish. And then we, um, we're we actually gonna do it hands-on. So we'll have a little instruction sheet about how to make your own nori wrap and you can put whatever you want in there. So we have avocados and carrots and zucchini noodles and uh, tomatoes, like the sky's the limit. That's the whole idea of California fusion cuisine is there really is no wrong way to make a nori wrap as long as it's delicious so that's what we're doing is you get to make your own custom nori wrap of course with the help from our chefs and we'll be providing all the nori sheets and and uh we can cut up the nori wraps for you and we're serving that with a mango avocado sauce um as well as a sauce that i invented just for the festival which is a teriyaki sauce so this is going to be a a nut-free teriyaki sauce with ginger and garlic and uh, salt free too. So we're actually not using um, any soy sauce in it or anything, but it's going to be a really nice uh, Japanese flavor for the nori wrap. So that's the menu. Oh my gosh. Okay. Honestly, I have never had raw vegan Indian food ever. Has anybody here ever had that? I've never. Uh, so I'm really excited for your, um, I think you said your 
crafting a book right now, right? You're working on a recipe book. That's right. Yeah. It took me about three months to come up with the, like all the different recipes for the Indian food, but I have desserts and um, lots of entrees and appetizers like samosas and things, but uh, that's very, very difficult to find raw Indian food. In fact, I, I know very few raw vegan restaurants, even high-end ones that even try to attempt raw vegan Indian food, but it is actually surprisingly easy, but you just have to understand how the flavors work of the ginger and the garlic and the turmeric and the curry powder and the garam masala and the coriander and the cumin. But in my opinion, it's the highest level of food. I really love uh, Indian cuisine. So these malai koftas are um, just the epitome of Indian cuisine. In fact, that was the picture of me standing in front of about 100 uh, koftas for the newsletter uh, picture that we sent out. So everybody's going to get tons of Indian koftas to try and and I would say that if this is uh, the the world's best raw vegan restaurant for one week, that's going to be, in my opinion, the best night because the Indian night is just going to be something you've never tried before. And hopefully uh, you'll remember it for the rest of your life because it's very hard to find raw vegan Indian food. <laughs> Absolutely. I've never seen it. I've never had it. I haven't had Indian food, Ocean, in like in 13 years, 14 years. <laughs> No joke. So I'm really excited. And um, I love how you said it was easy. <laughs> yeah, easy for you. Easy for you because I'm like a samosa. Are you kidding me? But um, that's really exciting because those are like fried, right? Like, I mean, yeah. It's... Yeah, it's pretty amazing with the um, with the techniques that I've developed. You know, I've been doing this for for quite a while. I actually had became a chef because there was no raw vegan Indian restaurant, raw vegan restaurants or, you know, raw vegan Indian food was just completely out of the picture. It was basically just a bowl of almonds and a spoon when I first started. <laughs> so that's why I developed all these, these recipes, but it's, um, it's really interesting that these, uh, these flavors, you know, if you use the flavors from the cooked version, which Indian food is heavily cooked, it's very rare to find uh, raw Indian food, you know, salads, maybe sometimes there's a couple dishes Kosambari is one of them, which is a, a cucumber coconut salad. Um, but taking all those flavors that they would normally use and then transforming them uh, into a different medium. So rather than using uh, like heavy, you know, cooked garbanzo beans, you use sprouted garbanzo beans instead or sprouted sunflower seeds. And one thing that I learned is that you can actually mimic fried food pretty easily um, with just using the right amount of spices and, and using flax seeds to, to impart that crunch. So, so that's what, that's what I do with my, in my book with the samosas, but the koftas are going to be non-dehydrated because that's one thing that I wanted to do for this festival is that dehydration is also not as healthy as, as eating fresh food, living foods. So all the food, including the Indian food that I'll be making for the festival is all non-dehydrated, which means it's the freshest possible and just bursting with life. So I'm hoping that everyone takes that away from the festival is that uh, even if you eat at a raw vegan restaurant, it's still not as good as the food that you can make yourself at home. Oh my God, you read my mind because my next question is what percentage of the foods is going to be dehydrated? And that is absolutely incredible because that's my biggest like concern with eating raw vegan gourmet, which it mm -hmm. makes me, and I'm sure you too, and everyone on this call that eats a raw vegan diet, you know, it makes you very thirsty the next day. So that's exciting. That's why at Woodstock, everyone who hasn't been yet, you feel the best you've ever felt in your life, even on a raw vegan diet. Cause sometimes I just want to say some people go raw and they don't feel so great. They get bloated sometimes, or they feel thirsty or so uh, chef ocean on your regular, on a regular basis, how much dehydrating do you do personally, or do you eat dehydrated foods on a regular basis? Actually, I don't know. I, I um, practice what I call a living foods vegan diet. So it's a little bit step beyond a raw vegan diet. So a lot of times people will subscribe to a raw vegan diet and then they become very concerned. What is raw? You know, what is and raw is just something that's not heated over a certain temperature. But as you mentioned, that um, it can be very easy to get dehydrated because when you eat dehydrated food, your body wants to rehydrate it. And where does that water come from? Well, it comes from within your body. So it's actually pulling water from your body to rehydrate the food in order to digest it. So um, we are going to stay away from the dehydration because, you know, this is a fantastic festival. You should feel the best possible self that you can feel. You know, we're not doing 
any of the stimulants. We're not doing any of the normal things that people might do at a, at a summer festival, right? Which I've been to lots of West Coast festivals. And... We, we might have some cacao. <laughs> right. So we so... might, we might, but like that's the biggest stimulant that we'll have, you right. know, raw so cacao. You're not concentrating the cacao. You're just kind of eating some cacao. But you know what I mean? When I've been yeah. to like Burning Man, and I actually catered Burning Man in 2009. And um, so that's the type of stimulation I'm talking about. It's the type yeah, of stimulation yeah. that people would do at Burning Man. So let's talk about the scale of stimulation here. You know, so but if you're on, if you're looking to stay completely sober, then you can often miss this feeling of like, I just want to feel elated. I want to feel floaty, right? I want to feel fantastic. Well, food has that option for you. If you if you eat the best possible food, especially if it's bursting with life, if it's versus, you know, sprouts that we just sprouted and the, and the sprouts are just, you know, aiming, trying to build their plants and, and we eat that living food, uh, you'll find that that it, it brings you to the next level beyond raw uh, vegan food is that you're no longer eating food that's manipulated. It's the food, the way the plants intended you to eat it, the way the trees and, and everything, everything's intended to be consumed as close as possible to nature so that's my intention with this menu. And that's why I'm staying away from the dehydration, at least for this menu, which isn't to say dehydration is bad or anything. It's just that I want people to, to understand what that top level of nutrition, that top level of gourmet living food feels like. And that's what you're going to get at the festival. And that's why you are our head chef, because <laughs> I mean, that's very rare. That's very rare to find at any raw vegan gourmet restaurant in the world. Most of the things are going to be heavily dehydrated, heavily salted, heavily oiled, which we don't use any salt or oil. And um, Lots that's of nuts. A, yeah, well, sorry. Lots of nuts, too. That's very popular. Lots in the of nuts. Yeah. We don't use any nuts even. And your stuff tastes so good. <laughs> it's so gourmet. And um, it's without all the things that can interrupt digestion and make people not feel so good. So okay. I'm, oops, I love Okay. Oh, let me mute you. Sorry, Lankaya. Sorry. Um, but if anybody does have a question, by the way, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. And uh, yeah, Nicole, it sounds really delicious and healing. And yes, I cannot wait for you as well to be there. Um, I have to say the last festival, amazing. Obviously, the food was amazing. I tried to recreate the coconut ceviche that you did. And it didn't taste the same. So I'm just curious. I know that, okay, do you have any tips or tricks uh, for people um, that want to, they're going to come to the festival and they want to recreate the meals at home or the people that are not coming to the festival? Do you have some tips and tricks for people since you are um, a raw vegan chef that doesn't dehydrate? very much and doesn't use all these stimulants and oil and salt. What are some of your best tips and tricks for people that aren't a chef? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I've actually thinking, been thinking about how to phrase this all day. So what I want to express is the way that plants relate to us and the way that trees relate to us is they are here for us, right? As they spend all this time six months, three months, making these fruits and vegetables for us, right? And what's the first thing we do is we take these fruits and vegetables and, you know, as a, as a society, we put them in the fire, we chop them up, we mix them with all kinds of stuff. And this beautiful thing that these plants and, and trees have created for us gets buried under our own, uh, under our own um, idea of what these things should taste like. So my biggest tip is to go to the farmer's markets, go to your local CSA or your even your local farm and start that relationship with the farmers and the vegetables that they're producing. And what you'll find is that the quality of those fruits and vegetables, the produce, the, the seeds, whatever you're eating is so much higher when you have a direct relationship to it. And so to recreate these meals is to have that relationship where you go to um, the, excuse me, to the produce market and you look for the brightest colors you can possibly find. Like don't settle for those tomatoes that they're trying to push on you because they're cheap. Go buy like the heirloom tomatoes, the ones that were actually grown with a lot of care that were picked ripe. 
And so for any dish that you're recreating, that's the baseline is to have these plants that were allowed to mature the fruit and were allowed to mature the vegetables. They were given enough space and time to be able to produce the best possible thing because that's what they want to do for us. I mean, we should let the tomatoes be, be fully right before we eat them rather than picking them really early, you know. Um, and then, of course, not doing too much to them. So that's the idea of that coconut ceviche, which we, um, let's see, I would say there's a secret ingredient, which I'll tell you about, which you probably have, but it, it also, anyway, we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. But the quality of the fruits and vegetables is the number one reason that these dishes taste so good. And because we're in Florida this year, we're going to get even higher quality produce than we got in New York. And that's the secret to this is to understand what the vegetables are trying to say, what they're trying to, to give to us and allow those flavors to come out and then using different spices to enhance the flavors rather than trying to bury them. So that's what we're trying to do here is, for instance, the coconut ceviche can be very easy just to put a bunch of lime juice all over it. And then it just tastes like lime, but then you miss all the flavors of the basil and the mint and the mango and the coconut, because those are things that took a long time to develop too, right? A coconut takes like nine months to develop and the tree really wants you to enjoy it. So you should allow that to carry through. And then I'd say the, the secret ingredient is when you're making food by yourself, you can put a lot of love into it, but food tastes much better when someone else makes it for you. And then when you're making it for people, with a lot of people, then it just becomes the best food possible. So we have a whole team that I actually have several raw vegan chefs that are coming specifically to the festival just to make food for people. So they, uh, in fact, I have um, my friend Leifi from Sweden is coming. He runs a raw vegan food truck. And then um, I have several other very, very well-known raw vegan chefs that are coming to put this love into the food. And that's really what it is, is we're going to respect all the ingredients. We're going to put as much love into it as possible. We all taste the food as we as we try it. And the proportions and the ingredients might change um, depending on what the recipe is. So a recipe is a guideline. But what you really want to find out is maybe these limes are, have a much more vibrant flavor than what I was expecting. So maybe I do want to back off on the limes a little bit to allow the coconuts to come in and the mangoes that we're going to get in, in Florida. But it's also that hidden ingredient that that care that we're putting into this, that we make sure that food tastes good before we serve it. And we all, you know, we we actually have some time set aside at the end of our food preparation where we just sit down and we just all try it a little bit and say, oh, I like this, we should add a little bit of this and just make it absolutely perfect. So that's my tip and trick is to use high quality produce and just set aside that time to make it delicious, you know, and to understand how the fruits and vegetables are talking to you. Oh yeah, that's good. I had to spotlight you because ooh, <laughs> that was good. That's that. Yeah, that's it. And also, did anybody ever notice that like food tastes better when you're sharing it with people you love it? There's something different about, I don't know how that's even possible, but it's just what you just said. That's it. Because like when I'm eating durian by myself, it doesn't taste the same. It could be really, really good, but it's not the same experience. Like there's the only thing better than amazing high quality fruit is when you're eating it with other people that really enjoy it, that you love, the company that you love. And so I'm really excited for us all to be together. And yeah, so with the, the quality of the produce this year, it's going to be out of this world. We've always had it in New York City. Well, in New York, upstate New York for the past 11 years. And we've gotten a lot of local, a lot of organic. Um, we've got, we've been lucky to get good stuff, local greens and uh, I think tomatoes. We've always gotten some local stuff, but this year the majority of the food will be local. And when you have local fruit that is grown without any pesticides that is grown, you know, a mile away and grown and picked ripe, that is just like the ultimate. And so I just found a um, a farmer that has amazing black sapotes. So it is going to be off the chain this year. The best for sure. I wasn't in Hawaii. Did you go to the Hawaii festival? Uh, no, I didn't, but I have property in Hawaii. So I'm there quite often, but I, I wasn't able to go to the Hawaiian one. No. Okay. 
I wasn't at the Hawaii one either. So maybe Hawaii was amazing too, but I promise you this is going to be probably for sure the best festival aside from Hawaii, maybe, um, because of the quality of the fruit that we're getting, locally grown, amazing, um, organically grown, exotic tropical fruit. And, you know, I mean, jackfruits are growing here, sapodillas, canastel, we're going to have um, so many exotic fruits that we've never had in New York. You know, we never we, we were never able to have the canastels and the black sapotes and the locally grown passion fruit and things like that. So I'm really, really excited for that and to share with you as well, Chef Ocean. I'm excited to share food with people that like, like appreciate it as much as me. And um, that's rare also to find. And just everything you said made so much sense. And then that's why it tasted so amazing. And I make it at home and it tastes really good, but it's not the same. I also think that, um, do you marinate that for like a, a specific amount of time? Like the ceviche specifically? Oh, uh, yeah, the ceviche. Yeah, we make it a few hours ahead of time and make sure that it gets marinated because uh, there's the mangoes, the mango juice comes out and then the coconut um, and the lemon, they just kind of interact. And what happens is you have to give the, the I'm sorry, the lime, we use lime in that one. Um, the lime, the acidity of the lime breaks down uh, some of the flavors. So it actually creates a whole different flavor. So lime by itself and mango by itself are two different things and combining the two and letting the acidity of the lime kind of pre-digest the mango a little bit. And then it creates this whole new synergy between the two, uh, kind of like how papaya and lime interact. Yeah, that, those are the kind of secrets that I need in my life. Okay, you guys just heard that, right? So basically some of us were making food really quickly and then we're eating it really quickly. But like a professional chef, like you just heard, it needs to sit, it needs to marinate. And um, whenever we do that with raw foods, the flavors change. Um, wow, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so the sauce, the sauce specifically, the coconut ceviche is, we use basil in that as well, basil and mint. And so if you remember, uh, I don't know if, if how, how long it's been since you drank, but it's been over 25 years since I drank, but I've seen people mix drinks. And I know that they do things like they'll rub the mint on the lip of the of the drink first, or they'll they'll take a um, some sort of plunger and they'll crush the mint or crush the basil first. And then what that does is it imparts the flavor of the mint and the basil throughout the whole dish. So that's another key to the ceviche is that sauce when you eat when you're drinking the sauce that it that it marinates in, you should get the flavors of the basil and the mint because they've had time to marinate in it rather than just getting um, the lime sauce and then occasionally getting a little bite of mint or um, or basil in there. But yeah, yeah, that was a good recipe for you to pick to try because that is a really fun one. Yeah, it's so yeah, and it's so simple. Like, I mean, the, the ingredients are simple, the recipe is simple, but yet so complex. I love that one. I gotta, okay, I gotta let it marinate. So Lankaya says that she started her garden but after the fruit festival, can you interview? Oh, okay. She wants me to interview Yaki Awakened. Um, by the way, I have reached out to him. Um, he, I don't know. He's, um, his people have not gotten back to me, but I have definitely reached out. And if you got, if you want to message him, say you should uh, let Miss It Vegan interview you, then I will definitely interview him. He's amazing. And I would love to, but I uh, haven't been able to get in touch. Will Miami Ohm be a long-term venue for Woodstock? Okay, that is a great question. We're not sure yet. The honest truth is that we are going to do the festival, which is, by the way, 20 days away, Ocean. Are you like, are you ready? It's 20 days away. Yeah, I, I already bought my ticket a few months ago, and I'm actually going to be staying a couple days earlier and a couple days later for the festival just to kind of absorb the whole uh, time. But yeah, it's coming up pretty quick. It's coming up. Um, and, um, so, uh, we are going to do the festival here in South Florida in at Ohm, uh, which is the property that we are renting and we'll see if we love it. If you guys love it, um, then we might do another one there. We're not sure yet. Uh, we don't have any plans. Um, we were thinking about having another festival in 2024 that's open. We might have another one, but again, we don't know yet. We have to see what um what this is like it's a brand new venue for us we're gonna see how we like it and then we'll decide on the last day um for sure if we do have it at home we will decide before the festival is over okay that's some inside information because yeah 
So if we're, if we love it, you know, we have the full festival there on the last day of the festival, we will announce if we're going to have it there again and, and the dates we will announce the next dates of that locations festival. So that's exciting. Um, so you guys let us know throughout the week, come up to me or chef ocean and let us know, Hey, how you're liking it. Um, you know, and, um, we yeah, I've never been to own myself. Um, I did see some pictures of it. So it looks like the camping area is kind of in a fruit orchard and, um, it's, uh, I think a big difference is that when we had it at, uh, in upstate New York, that was like a kid's camp that we were at. And so the, the beds, at least in the bunk beds were kind of like small and built for kids. But I think this whole camping outside, um, in the warm weather, um, just as a break from wintertime, uh, in Florida at a place that's actually meant for adults <laughs> is going to be a big <laughs> a big improvement as well as the area around. So I've been to Homestead a few times. I, um, my friends uh, uh, who work at Miami Fruit, I wrote a recipe book with them and spent a few weeks um, uh, hanging out in the area. And there's lots of cool things in Homestead as well. So there's uh, something I've never seen before, which is a fruit and spice park. And I think uh, we might be taking some field trips there. I don't know. I've, I've heard some rumors about that, but it's actually um, a a few hundred acres, I think, where they specifically set aside these heirloom trees, like they have a hundred mango trees and they have um, lots of different exotic fruit trees and exotic spice trees that you can go and you just pay a small amount of money and you can go in and spend all day there, just wandering around seeing what these trees actually look like. Um, they even had a miracle berry fruit uh, bush last time I was there where you could mix everything taste sweet, even lemons. Um, they had jackfruits that were the size of a small child. Um, I was able to get canistels and I think the only rules they have is that you can't pull anything off of a tree and you can't leave with any fruit. But if you see some fruit on the ground or some fruit drops while you're there, then they encourage you to eat it and you get to see exactly what a mango tree looks like or exactly what a canistel tree looks like or jackfruit. Um, it's a fantastic place. So the whole area around the, the festival is really fun to play in too. Yes, we're all going to take a field trip to Fruit and Spice Park. Hopefully, Chef Ocean and I can go as well. We will see. Hopefully, maybe. Um, but uh, it's, go it's yeah, that is a dream. Me and Brianna, who's on the call, we went. And, oh, my gosh, that is Disneyland. Fruit and Spice Park is Disneyland. And, um, wow, you got Canistel there. I had uh, Aki there. Aki. Um, and yeah, the mango's out of control. I mean, it's just like the best fruit of your life. Um, and Fruit and Spice Park is my favorite place on earth for sure. And it's very close to home. I think it's 10 minutes away and it's $10 to go to this magical Disney world. And yes, um, good point. Ohm is a, is more of a retreat center and Woodstock Fruit Festival has always been at a summer camp. So, I mean, Ohm is the perfect location because it is a fruit orchard. And by the way, we have star fruit trees on the property, lychee trees on the property, we, although it's not lychee season, but we have avocado trees. So hundreds of avocado trees. So we think, I can't guarantee, but we're going to eat as many fruit um, on the property as we want. So we might make the guacamole with the avocados from our trees in Ohm. We'll see. But otherwise, they'll be growing close by. We have, um, what else on the property? Mame sapote trees. We have um, mango trees, but it's not the season. Um, and that's the thing. We want to do, we want to do a festival in Florida during mango season, but nobody would really enjoy it because Chef Ocean, when did you come here? When did you spend time in Homestead? What month? Uh, I think it was around March or April. I think it oh, was. It was yeah. just. It was the end of uh, black sapote season. The mame sapotes were just starting to come out, um, and uh, from what I remember, the the um, the neighborhood actually in Homestead. There's so many farms in Homestead that grow exotic fruit that um, I was actually able to just walk down the street and get aki and get um, what else was I was I getting there? I think it was avocados too. Because if if someone's trees grow over the road or they grow over the sidewalk or they grow over the the little easement, that's public property. So as long as you're not crossing their property boundary, you can actually just pick the fruit. And aki fruit's a kind of a special one. That's the cheese fruit, which if I remember at the fruit and spice park, they have little signs around it that says "Do not eat this fruit." I know, <laughs> but I'm a professional fruity weirdo, yeah. so I was like, "Oh, I'm eating this. 
Yeah, because there's parts of it that are very toxic, but if you know how to peel apart the toxic parts of it, it's a great fruit. It has to open up fully. But I remember walking around Homestead and actually finding an Aki tree just growing on the corner um, over the road. And I was, I went, went over and just grabbed a ladder and just started pulling them off. But um, yeah, Homestead's actually, it's a really fun place. So I, I know even if we can't get some of the fruits that we want there, we can always just go. So there, there's some nearby farmer's markets as well as just fruit kind of urban foraging is what I would call it, where you can just kind of walk down the side of the road. And as long as you're not crossing anyone's property and, the, and it's hanging over the, the public areas, then you can just reach up and grab an avocado yourself. Absolutely. That's what it's like in Homestead. And that's why I moved here. You know, I'm from New York, guys. You guys probably know that. Um, and I moved here because it's the best fruit in the United States, in my opinion. I uh, have not been to Hawaii. Uh, so, Chef Ocean, what would you say? Would you say who has better fruit, Hawaii or South Florida? Uh, it's it's pretty much a, a toss up. I mean, in, in Hawaii, it's a small island. So you don't get these like uh abundance of fruit and vegetables that you would get like when I, i've been to mexico for instance at playa del carmen and tulum which is really really close to a uh, homestead it's just across the gulf of mexico and i mean the it's so abundant that it actually ends up being really inexpensive so i've gotten mami sapotes for like 10 cents a piece but going to hawaii you know it's it's not uncommon to pay four or five dollars for mami sapote so i think that's the thing that florida has over Hawaii is that there's such, such abundance, especially when things are in season, like mami sapote, that you don't really have to spend a lot of money to get your fruits. No, but I got to go to Mexico. Whoa. I have never, I have not been. Yeah, that, oh. that is probably the dream place in the United States. Well, that's not the United States, but you know, that's probably the dream because it's cheap and abundant and it, everything grows there. Even mango steam too. Yeah, right? Playa del Carmen is, is a really quick, a trip from uh, from Miami, and uh, it's not unusual just to get mami sapotes. I mean, you can get them ten for a dollar during the season, and they're the big ones too. Yeah. <laughs> My God, <laughs> can you imagine? Okay, sorry. Wait, I have a question for you. Um, how come mango steam grows in in uh, Mexico, but durian doesn't? D does durian grow in Mexico? Uh, that's a good question. I, I did some research when I was there. It was very difficult to find durian in Mexico. I think it more has to do with the the culture, just not being supportive of it. I mean, durian is it's a it's a niche fruit. So, um, and if you're going to devote uh, land to grow in something, durians take a long time to mature. Um, so, I think it's more that uh, you know it's it's just not. I mean, if you grow them, you'd have to find someone to buy them from you. So, and I think yeah. Florida is the same way too. I, I know that um, at least in Miami fruit, they they have people who are specifically in Thailand picking out the best durians. Um, but to try to grow durian there, uh, I, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's just the, the the climate itself just isn't amenable to it. But as a durian lover, it's it's kind of disappointing that we really can't find durian in the U.S. except some parts of Hawaii. And that's why I still go back to Hawaii every once in a while. Oh, durian grows in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And people okay. actually eat it there too. So I think that's why they grow it. You know? <laughs> no, what you just said is absolutely true. And if anybody has any questions for Chef Ocean, let us know. We're only here for another like 15, 20 minutes, but um, Chef Ocean, as you can see, you can ask him anything and he probably knows the answer. And I always wanted to know that because I was like, wait, if the climate can grow mangosteen, then it can probably go grow durian, but you're absolutely right. There's not a demand. There's not going to be a demand for durian like there is for mangosteen. Um, and yeah, it's a very niche fruit, which, by the way, we will have at Woodstock, of course. So if you haven't been to Woodstock, if this is your first one, we always have a durian party. The first or second night, I can't remember now if it's the first night or the second night. I think it's the second night. Um, I can't remember. Does anybody know? Is it the first night? Or the second? I don't remember eating durian the first night I was there last year. No, no, no. Okay, so it's the second night. And then we're going to have two, three, or four durian parties throughout the week. Um, and uh, we are getting the best in the world. So I'm really, really excited. Um, and they want to know, Chef Ocean. Okay, wait. We had a few questions first. Yeah, right? I'm going to go grab a prop real quick. Okay. One of the questions um, was, what's your favorite fruit to eat every day? So yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I am. I love zucchini. I, I can't get enough of it. That's like one of my main fruits that I eat 
um, almost Whoa. every day. I'll make zoodles out of it and hummus. And I actually made quiche the other day with it. And um, uh, yeah, I just love zucchini. It's one of my favorite fruits. But uh, right now I'm on this um, this little mandarin kick. So I got wow. I found these cute little mandarins at the uh, at my local store. So I like the easy to peel ones. So like when they're when there's a little bit of space between the skin and and the fruit, and I'll eat like six of those a day for breakfast. That's my favorite. are those sasumos? Yeah, I think that's what they are. The sasumos. Yeah, they're just you just stick your finger in them and you peel them like really easily, and then the whole skin just kind of falls right off. And these are my absolute favorite right now. And I eat them. I put them in the fridge and then I let them warm up for a little bit. But um, yeah, that's my favorite one. But I actually eat mostly fruit. Uh, I'm. I wouldn't say that I'm fruitarian. I don't know really know what that what the definition of fruitarian is. But if the definition of a fruitarian is that you eat primarily fruit and some vegetables, then that's what I am. So I eat a lot of tomatoes. Those are my favorites and zucchini. Um, I don't eat so many avocados, but I eat, had cucumbers today and coconuts are actually fruits. But um, in terms of like traditional sweet fruits, these are my go-tos right now. Yes, absolutely the same for me. I don't define myself as a fruitarian, but it feels like I am. It really does because, you know, 90% of what I eat is fruit, including, yeah, zucchini, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes. These are all fruits, guys. Um, and uh, do you eat a salad every night? Do you eat greens every day, Chef Ocean? Oh, uh, yeah. I have my favorite greens. I, I like spinach and arugula. Sometimes I make little coconut wraps um, and I put spinach and arugula in there. Uh, I'll eat kale sometimes. I like butter lettuce because I get really good butter lettuce around here, too. But, yeah, of course, I incorporate greens. It's, it's um, in my opinion, I don't do as well. I've tried eating all, all, all fruit before, just strictly nothing but fruit as a philosophical experiment. And it felt good, but I didn't feel it was sustainable. And I do work out a lot. And I think that the greens do help me with that, uh, too, with the sustainability of it. Um, but, yeah, the the greens are, are essential. I wouldn't, uh, for myself, I haven't found that I thrive as well unless I eat uh, a good portion of greens each day. Why do you think the greens help you with working out? Is it the protein content of the greens? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, I never thought of that before, but I also have, I love having greens. But fruit, fruits day. do have protein in them too, um, but especially uh, legumes. So legumes are technically a fruit, uh, peas, um, garbanzo beans, lentils. Um, my favorite is mung beans or gram beans. Recently, I used these mung dal to make a dish. Um, that's actually fruit. And as soon as it starts sprouting, then it becomes really high in protein. So um, being a fruitarian does not mean a low protein diet, but typically people approach a fruitarian diet as saying, okay, I'm going to go to Whole Foods and I'm just going to eat fruit. There's bananas, there's apples, there's oranges. You, you can't survive. I can't survive on that, right? You need a huge variety of, of fruits and vegetables. And some people would say, oh, peas are a vegetable. That's fine. Culinarily, they're a vegetable. But Botanically, they're a fruit. And so if you eat fresh peas, then that's a very high source of protein. A lot of bodybuilders use pea protein and hemp protein, right, in their um, in their protein powders. So uh, I want to make sure that's clear is that eating a become being a fruitarian does not in any way mean that protein is deficient in the diet. In fact, you're going to get as much protein as you as you need, as long as you don't restrict yourself in that way where you're saying, okay, I'm just going to eat cantaloupe for the next six months or something like that. That's in my opinion, that's good for the short term, but not for the long term. Absolutely agree. Okay, we have a bunch of questions. So um, Nadine on YouTube, thank you so much for being here. She wants to know if we're able to get the coconut ceviche recipe. So I'm curious, do you have that recipe in a book of yours that we can purchase? Yeah, I actually do um, a 20% off. And I think that one is my least expensive book. I do a Woodstock Fruit Festival. I did a volume one last year and I'll do a volume two this year. Um, most five of the recipes are the same and I'm introducing two different recipes this year. Um, but I have the whole breakdown, the exact recipe that we do at the festival, just cut down. So it only serves one, one or two people rather than 250 or 400 as we did last year. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's very reasonable. I think I'd sell normally if you're not, uh, at the Woodstock Fruit Festival, I think I sell that one for like $5 or something that has seven or eight recipes in it. Um, but if you're at the festival, then you get a discount code. And I think I, I even drop, I think it's like $4 to get all the recipes or something. And that's just to cover, you know, my costs of, of uh, printing up the little QR code things. 
but uh, yeah, you get the recipes. Um, they're for sale on my website, rawvegan.love or on my Instagram. Um, but I will give a code. I think it's Woodstock 20 is what it was last year. I love fruit 20 or something like that. So yeah, you can get the recipes. Thank you so much. Yes, I will leave the link below this video. Um, we want to know, Bill wants to know if you're going to have your books for sale at Woodstock this year, like mm, physical I, copies. Mm, yeah, I only do eBooks, which means you can print them yourselves at home. So that's just to kind of reduce the the carbon footprint and be more environmentally friendly. But I do have PDFs that are ready to print. Um, I've printed them before. And um, then I, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but sometimes when people read books, they subconsciously, or they look at pictures, they subconsciously want to pinch zoom the picture. <laughs> I've done that with photographs, like Polaroid photographs. I've done that with books before where this, this muscle memory takes over and I grab it and I just want to zoom in on a certain part of it. So that's why I do the eBooks is they're, they're made for people who have might um, have issues with uh, small type and things like that. So, um, but yeah, you can definitely uh, use that code that I'll give you um, at the festival. If you come up to me, I'll, I'll be at the, uh, at the tables uh, when we, I think all the presenters do um, tables, or you can just catch me in the, um, whenever you see me around the festival and uh, I'll have a little QR code or I can just tell you what the code is and you can pick up a, a copy of it and print it out yourself if you want the printed copy, but otherwise you can just read it on your, your phone or your, or your computer or tablet. Yes, very nice. I'll be at the presenters, um, what do we call it? The presenters, uh, workshop yeah presenters workshop which is the last day and i will have my books for sale i have killed some trees unfortunately to <laughs> print out some books which i never did either ocean like literally just in the last month i started publishing my books but um i was always like why are we doing this we don't need to do this we can just you know ebooks are the, are amazing um and then we don't have to use any paper and stuff but um yeah, so that is really a great idea with the QR code. I got to figure out how to do that. Um, I need a QR code um, tutorial <laughs> because that's going to be way easier for me to, to tell people instead of like, you know, this link or, you know, how to get my stuff. Um, the the boomer parents do that. <laughs> Looks like there was a question about mushrooms. And I actually do have a lot to say about mushrooms. Oh, oh yes. Star Vegan Love. Okay, you're raw vegan love. Star Vegan Love, she wants to know if you eat or use mushrooms. Uh, yes, in small amounts. So that's the short answer. In small amounts, I do. Um, so I, I uh, am a certified herbalist. I actually got my certificate um, earlier in 2023. And uh, from um, uh, going around and understanding, you know, the where plants grow, how to harvest them sustainably, what the medicinal effects of the plants are, how to process them. Um, I don't use alcohol, so I was processing them with like vinegar and oil and and uh, different things to extract them. And then I moved on to learn about mushrooms because that's kind of my path here is I really want to promote the idea of wild foods and foraging foods. I think that's even a step beyond what I'm doing now, which is living vegan foods, which are cultivated foods. They're grown on a farm under perfect conditions. But I found that sometimes these wild foods that we uh, that we don't cultivate, right? They just grow on their own. They're like an, an exponential or astronomically more beneficial for you. Uh, a good example being purslane, for instance. Purslane is far more nutritious than even the most nutritious vegetable we can grow. Seaweeds, they're incredibly nutritious. So as part of that journey, I, I learned more and more about mushrooms. Um, mushrooms, unfortunately, are very difficult and even dangerous to digest raw in most of them unless they're cultivated. So that's the one area that I found that wild mushrooms, the heat when people cook them breaks down the dangerous components, which can do various things like uh, damage your liver, damage your kidneys, or you know, in the extreme cases, they can kill you within a, within a few days. Um, so it's, you have to be very careful with mushrooms, but there is one, spe excuse me, one species of mushroom that we've cultivated to not have those dangerous and harmful constituents in it, like agaritine and things like that, which is um, the portobello family. So white button mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portobello mushrooms have been bred so that they can be eaten raw, uh, some in small amounts. So I, I do use those sometimes. And I won't be introducing those at the festival though, because um, there are 
people that just they don't like mushrooms. And one thing about mushrooms is they eat off of dead things where we're trying to promote at the festival. And in my lifestyle in general is about live things, right? Eating in sun food, right? And mushrooms are generally the opposite. Like they grow by being at the opposite end of the scale. So um, it's it's just something that my personal preference is I use mushrooms very sparingly because I, I really like the flavor of Kermini mushrooms, um, but I don't incorporate them daily. And, and I definitely would recommend doing research um, before attempting to eat any mushroom, whether it's cooked or raw, especially if you're foraging them. So that's my thoughts on mushrooms, but I love them. I love picking them. I love finding them, but I just don't eat them. Okay, thank you so much for that. Yeah. And thank you for that question, Star. Star, by the way. And guys, we only have a few minutes left, five minutes. So if anybody has any questions for Chef Ocean or me, or about the festival, let me know. This is the time to ask. Um, if you have any questions, you can either type it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, Star Vegan Love just won a free ticket to the Woodstock Fruit Festival because I was running a winter raw food challenge for the whole month of December. She was 100% raw and posted every day and she won she manifested a ticket to the Woodstock Fruit Festival. So you're going to get to meet Star Vegan Love. Because I think your name is Raw Vegan Love, right? On Instagram? Yeah, Raw Vegan Love. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so similar. But, um, and uh, she said, I totally agree. and glad you're not using mushrooms at the festival. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think we do have like criminis usually cut up. Like for, yeah, for like, people that like to yeah. Eat them, yeah, I think we either have Cremini's or Portobello's, but again, it's a choice too. Yeah, like we have yeah. um, all kinds of different, like we have corn and things like that. And, you know, I eat, I eat corn, but it's, it's really that salad bar is, um, is full of all kinds of stuff and, you know, you don't have to eat them, but I won't be putting them in the gourmet recipes. I am so excited and I'm so happy we did this because I don't know why I just assumed that a lot of things would be dehydrated. I didn't even like, cause I saw the menu and I was like, there's no way, but I'm so excited that nothing will be dehydrated. That is just like such a treat for me um, because I don't, I can't eat at raw vegan restaurants. I can't, you know, after 13 years, uh, like I can't, it'll make me, it makes me so bloated and thirsty the next day. And I just don't feel good. Um, just so everybody does know, we will have some, lightly dehydrated things for you know optional so we have our world famous raw cinnamon buns made of just simply bananas dates raisins and cinnamon and some vanilla bean and by the way nicole who's giving a heart there she's going to be making them she's our volunteer on the banana roll team so she was an attendee in the past and now she has signed up to make the festival happen make it happen um, you know, like uh, me and Chef Ocean working behind the scenes to make this amazing festival happen. So thank you, Nicole, for that. And I'm really excited. And by the way, those like cinnamon rolls are like, they are so good. And I always eat way too many. So just a heads up, you want to don't, don't overdo it on those. Okay. Focus on the fruit, focus on the salad bar. Don't overdo it on the cinnamon rolls because you will pay a price. Do you overdo it too, or is that just me? Oh, the the reason I'm laughing is because um, when the first couple of days of the festival are are always different than the last the last <laughs> few days, the, the second half of the festival, because everyone comes in and they they're used to the idea of not having abundance. So, yeah. like the cinnamon rolls, there's just <laughs> this run on cinnamon rolls, and we can never make enough for the first few days. But by the time the second half of the festival rolls around, like people are just like. I already ate eight, eight of them today. I think I'm good. So that's my my tip for everyone at the festival is pace yourself. There's lots and lots and lots of food. I mean, this is an abundant festival. Um, you're not going to be scrabbling for anyone to eat the last piece of whatever, right? Is that there's incredible abundance, especially with the durian too. Uh, people often will grab one or two durians and run away to their cabin and squirrel it away. And then we have to spend like two or three hours at, at the end of the festival trying to find out what that smell is in the cabin well it's because someone stashed a durian because they were afraid there weren't going to be enough durians and they stuck it like behind the shower stall or something like that and we're like oh what's that doing back there but then it's because they discovered oh 
it's not just one night of durian it's like four nights of durian and there's like enough durian to, to where you just don't want to eat any more durian so that's my my suggestion is pace yourself especially with the cinnamon rolls you will get plenty of cinnamon rolls but you don't need to eat them all on the first day <laughs> don't do what we have all done and by the way i'm taking notes because that's such a good thing that i, I want to talk about in the opening ceremony which is this is a festival of abundance we don't we're never going to run out of fruit we're going to have way more than you've ever seen in your entire life and it is absolutely a, a very like exciting experience especially like the first few days you just like i i've gone you know i think this is my sixth or seventh one and it's just still i can't believe all this fruit and just this abundance but like yeah the cinnamon rolls if you do overeat them the first two days you will learn your lesson and then you'll slowly eat less and less and less but they are so freaking good oh my god they're so good that they're the best thing yeah i love them you can't control yourself but then they are dehydrated so i just want everyone to know that you know you know you have a few but like pace yourself that's a good that's a good tip okay and um i oh, think mommy sapote too if i, I remember at the end of the last two festivals um we had so much mommy sapote we didn't know what to do with it we started turning in ice cream i mean we were like sending people home with cases of mommy sapote <laughs> at, at the end of the last two festivals we just couldn't eat them yeah. there was so much so if you have never had mommy sapote it's the pumpkin pie fruit and um again pace yourself on those because there's plenty <laughs> yeah and that's the other thing too we only serve ripe fresh juicy, delicious fruit and vegetables, right? So like everything has to be ripe. So what happened last festival is that the mame wasn't ripe. So we didn't serve it. We're not gonna serve anything subpar. And that's another thing that Chef Ocean touched upon earlier at the top of the hour. I just want everyone to understand that fruit tastes the best and has the highest nutritional density when it is ripe. So it is very important because you were talking about the tomatoes. Don't just get the tomatoes that are on sale. Get the tomatoes that smell incredible. I think it's very important that we relearn how to eat because we we don't know how to eat at all. Um, and so smelling all of your fruit and vegetables before you eat them, especially fruit, it has to be fragrant. Tomatoes must be fragrant. Um, there's very few fruits that don't smell. I guess avocados and grapes, right? But some grapes do smell, actually. Yeah, I had some grapes when I was in France um, a couple months ago that were these muscatel grapes, which are the oldest grapes, oldest cultivated grapes, and it completely changed my life. I, I can't eat any other type of grape now, but those smell fantastic. Oh, they do smell. Okay, yeah. yeah. What about avocados? They never smell, right? Um, no, I want to go around smelling avocados. I don't know. <laughs> No, because I, these are the things I think about, you know, because yeah. I'm just like every fruit smells ocean, except those two. So I was, I think about it sometimes, but now I know grapes are supposed to smell. And you know what my favorite smell is, is um, I love the smell of tomato vines. You know that smell? Like yeah. a fresh tomato is fantastic, but I like the smell of the vine that it grows on too. I like that. Oh, so is that the smell I love? I thought it was the tomato, but it seems to always be on the vine tomatoes. That's yeah, I mean, they're, they're two different smells, but the, the smell of the tomato vine is just heavenly. Not, you know, if you're getting the tomatoes in the store and you don't get the vine on it, um, you owe it to yourself to at least find some tomatoes in the vine and just crack it open and smell the vine. That's the, uh, the smell I love. Yeah. You know, I always learn something when I talk to you. So I just want to say thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for your generosity and for going through the whole week, the menu for everybody at home, everybody here on the Zoom. Um, one last question I just wanted to answer. Um, somebody asked if you sprout. Well, they asked me and you if we sprout. So do you sprout on a regular basis? I think you said you do. Oh, yeah. I have a whole sprouting section in my kitchen. Uh, let's see. What am I sprouting today? I'm sprouting gram beans. Uh, I have sunflower seeds. Uh, I just soak some flax seeds. Um, sprouting is life. So you have to take any seed that's been dehydrated for transportation purposes so they don't get moldy. And you have to let them rehydrate so that they become alive and wake up. And uh, that's essential. So we will be doing that for all the any seeds that we're using in the festival, whether it be sesame seeds, sunflower seeds. They're at least going to be soaked so they have the proper level of hydration. And then some of the seeds will sprout uh, within, you know, half a day or a day. 
Um, but sprouting is, um, that's the key to longevity is, is a raw or living foods vegan is uh, you have to incorporate those sprouts. They're uh, fantastic for you. They're the, they're a major source of life energy. Mm, all right. I'm going to start sprouting again yeah. um, because I always fall off, but um, okay. Can I just sprout sunflower seeds? Like oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. As long as they're not irradiated. Yeah. And you don't even need the hull on them. You can just get the organic sunflower seeds um, that haven't been, you know, sometimes they microwave them or heat them or they do something to, to kill them. Um, if they don't, if they just soak and turn gray, uh, then they're, they're not alive. But uh, I get sunflower seeds here that um, they'll split open like this. And then the two halves of the seed actually become the first two leaves, the dicotyledons. And then there's a little root that grows off the back of it. Um, those are the ones you want to eat. And they're cool thing about sprouts is if you buy a pound of sunflower seeds and you soak them in water and wait a day, you get a pound and a quarter. You wait two days, you get a pound and a half. After three or four days, you get two pounds of food. So you're literally growing food. And, and even if sunflower seeds cost three or four dollars a pound, now you're reducing the cost of it by half just by letting them become alive before you eat them. Wow. I've never tried to, but I have plenty in my house. Okay. I'm going to try that. I'm going to get back to my sprouting because I fell off. But it's so easy. It's so there's no excuses not to sprout. It's just so easy. No soil needed. I have a video on YouTube. If you guys want to check it out, just type in Misfit Vegan Sprout. There's a whole chapter in my book about sprouts. So thank you, Ocean. And also, um, uh, Chic Chick. OK, we have one more question. I'm so sorry. One more. Is that OK, Ocean? Yeah, I have a couple minutes. Sure. Thank you so much. OK. So Amanda wants to know, is histamine intolerance causing inflammation and pain for real? I'm suspecting I'm suffering from that at the moment. What are fruits and vegetables um, that are best to avoid? So is histamine intolerance causing inflammation and pain? Hmm. That is a good question. Uh, Ocean? Um, yeah, I think that it would it'd probably be best to... Um... To consult someone who has a little bit more knowledge about histamines. Um, my knowledge is just from experimenting with my own body and seeing what my reactions are. I found that I do best when I stay on an all fruit diet. And if I find that I'm getting allergic reactions to anything, I go back to a very, very, very basic diet, which is like zucchini noodles and arugula, no oil, some lemon juice, uh, tomatoes, avocado, cucumber, and just really be gentle with my body. Um, and that seems to be work for me. Um, but as far as like getting a, you know, a problem like that solved, um, it's probably best to go maybe find someone at the festival who might have a little bit more knowledge. I know that Don Bennett would love to talk your ear off. And if, as long as he's coming again this year, which um, he will tell you probably everything you need to know and far more um, about histamines and about how the body reacts to it. He's he's our resident uh, knowledge expert and has a very good basis in science. So I would say, let's defer that question to Don. If you're going to the festival, you'll find him and he, he'd be extraordinarily happy to talk with you about that. Be careful. Be careful what you ask Don because he'll tell you the answer. He'll, he'll tell, tell you. you. <laughs> and you might not like it, but- um, right. Don't he be in a hurry you. when you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chef Ocean. You are amazing. I can't wait to work with you again. I love working with you. You always put so much love, passion, dedication, attention to detail in everything you do. And um, I'm a big fan. And um, yeah, maybe um, we'll do an interview at the festival if you have time. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to just making the best food I possibly can. This is a restaurant that's only open for one week. And in my opinion, this is the world's best restaurant. I mean, in, in every way possible. So um, I'm just happy that everyone shows up and eats the food. It's fantastic. Yes. yes, I can't wait. Thank you very, very much, everyone who's watching on YouTube, everyone that joined us live here on Zoom. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in 20 days. Yeah, less than okay. three weeks. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Okay. See you guys soon. Thank you okay. so much, Chef. I really appreciate Bye. this. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you, guys. The replay will be on YouTube if you'd like to watch it. And um, yeah, that's it. I love you guys. Thank you very much for being here. See you.